over two years since we've been able to do the town hall in three dimensions instead of just flat faces on a screen and audio recordings and the like. So really I'm happy that we're all able to come and say hi to each other and, and start to reintroduce ourselves to the Caltrans family, um, shake hands, see a smile, say hello. Something that uh, COVID really uh, brought home for me is the value of the personal connections. Uh, you don't realize what you have until it's taken away and roughly like it was with COVID for, for many of us. I know for our maintenance and construction field employees, not quite as much, but from uh, from my perspective, certainly missing not feeling so um, Before I dive into the, the bulk of what I wanted to talk about today, um, I wanted to take a moment to reflect and honor the Caltrans employees whom we've lost over the last two years. Um, they were our coworkers, our colleagues, and for many of us, our friends. Um, these are not our Caltrans Workers Memorial, but these are those that were Caltrans employees and family members that, that passed away over the last two years. So if we can queue up the video. of our Caltrans family members in our own way. But together we should continue to celebrate the lives and the time we all had with them. So I'll just take another moment of silence to remember. Thank you for, for doing that, I appreciate it. When I uh, first read my speaking points, um, I took a look at it, I thought, it's been a long time since we were together. And I took a look at the in memory video that we have and the names up there and the 40 and 20 year anniversaries. And I thought, this is about as good a time as ever to talk about what Caltrans means for me um, and to have an opportunity maybe for others online and in the audience to reflect on what it means for you. And I'm gonna start by telling a long story as short as I can, so bear with me. When I was growing up, went to college, never thought I'd end up in public service. Never thought about it. Came from a family that was all about private sector and starting your own business and finding success in other ways. Um, and I graduated, went to work for a small engineering firm. Was there for about a year and a half and got called in on a Friday afternoon and they said, we'd like for you to go to work for us in Arizona or Hawaii because there's no more work for us here in Orange County. No more work for you here in Orange County. At the time, I had a long term relationship with a girl in, in Newport. I thought I was going to spend the rest of my life with her. So I said, Well, let me go talk to my girlfriend. Drove home. I said, Hey, what do you think about Arizona and Hawaii? And she said, I don't like either one. Not going. So I quickly realized where she stood. And I quickly thought about my family being here, my personal family being here in Orange County. And I decided to take an opportunity and look for other opportunities in, in Southern California. And that's when I sort of fell into. Caltrans, District 7. They were hiring an environmental planner classification and I applied for it and was fortunate enough to be successful in that interview process. During that time with me applying for the job and coming on board with Caltrans, that girlfriend that I thought I was gonna spend the rest of my life with said, I'll see you. I was now single, starting a new job and looking for a new place to live. So I decided to relocate up to, to the South Bay area. Had some friends from college that let me sleep on a couch while I was commuting into District 7. Wound up meeting in with four other new hires in Caltrans. And two out of those four hires are still some of my best friends that I talk to at least once or twice a month today. One of them came down when my first when my son was first born and held him in the hospital. Um, and that's the first touch point that Caltrans, my work family had with my personal family at home. There's more to this story. Working in LA for a couple of years, my mom came down with cancer. She was here in Orange County. I had a supervisor that knew the kind of trials and tribulations that we were going through as a family. And she said, why do you look for work down in Orange County? District 12 might be hiring. And I said, I appreciate that, but it's going to take time for me to figure that out. She said, take as much time as you need. So I applied for a job in Orange County. Some of you may remember I, I was hired on and worked with uh, Leslie Mandershot and under Sylvia Vega at the time. And when I got hired on, I told them about what was happening in my life. And they said, family first, take care of your mother. Make sure you're taking care of yourself and your family first. 
That's the second touch point where Caltrans was there for me when I needed it. Okay. Fast forward again, I've got, I've been blessed with, um, been, I should have said when I went to LA and when I was commuting, that's where I also met my wife. So things very much do happen for a reason, right? Took a transfer to LA, met my wife, wound up relocating to Richard County. But when I was down here too, we decided to start a family. I've got two beautiful kids of my own now. Um, and when my kids were born, I said, hey, really like to spend some time with my son and my daughter when they're first born. All of you have this same same opportunity in front of you as well. Maybe you've taken up on that. But again, my managers and my supervisor said, take the time, it's there for you, bond with your kids. So I did that. And I think my family's better off for it. You know, as a, as a male, it's pretty tough to, to leave your wife and newborn kid at home and go to work. Some of you have done that probably, many of you probably have. Um, but I was blessed with a couple of weeks where I could sit, spend some time bonding with my children. That's the third point where Caltrans interacted with my personal family life and they were there for me. And again, the comment was family first. Okay. Shortly thereafter, my dad was diagnosed with Parkinson's. Some of you that know what Parkinson's like, it's not fun, it's not pleasant. But I remember when he was first diagnosed, we had a disability awareness month in Caltrans in the Michelson office. And there was a little exhibit where they said, come figure out what it's like to have mobility um, problems. And we put on these blather mitts. And then they said, now try and tie a top and zip up your jacket and see what that's like to have a disability to live with. And at the same time, we had just figured out my dad was gonna be living with this for the rest of his life, mobility skills. That's the fourth moment that Caltrans helped me get through a tough time in my life. I learned from that experience with Caltrans. I've learned from all of it. There's more, there's much more to this story. So then I went ahead and worked, uh, took two jobs in Sacramento, tried to relocate my family up there. Um, had another opportunity to come back down here. And, and when I did, I had a tough decision to make, stay in Sacramento for a career and headquarters or come back down to Orange County, my home, where I've learned to, to love the people I work with and where I was born and raised. So I did. My supervisor gave me this opportunity to come back and work with this beautiful work family that I have here today and that we all have here today. Um, when we were, when we thought about doing that, the conversation was, well, where do we really want to be? And as much as I love working in Sacramento on both trips when I was up there, I really love working in the district where you really get to know our team, the people that make the system work whether you're in the construction side, the maintenance field side, administrative side that keeps the glue together, the design, I can go on and on, traffic operations. To me, this is where we really get to see the fruits of our work. Um, I, uh, when I was up in Sacramento the second time, for a role that was pretty stressful, I would say, um, I had some other family problems. My daughter was going through some medical issues, my wife was going through some medical issues, um, and, and I went and talked to other leaders in Sacramento and I said, it's about time that I go home. It's about time I come back to Orange County. And they afforded me the opportunity to come back again. And they said, Ryan, family is always first. It's like the fifth or sixth time now I've heard that in my career. So I came back down here. Um, lo and behold, working in, in District 12 again, my mom came down with cancer for a third time. Okay? She's a fighter if you don't, if you don't get this old. And again, I told my supervisor and my, my new director now that I needed to take some time off to be the one to take my mom to her chemo, chemotherapy and radiation therapy. And you know what the answer was? Family first. It's now the sixth or seventh time I've heard this. Okay. My family is now doing wonderfully well. My mother is still alive and kicking and still fighting. My father is doing well. Um, but what this lesson in my career life has taught me is that there is a lot of overlap between my work family all of you, my friends, my colleagues, my peers, and my personal life. And I think the greatest joy that I've had with Caltrans is the ability to interact together and to have that blend. I go to Costco every now and then and I run into to Caltrans employees. Um, I don't see Jose here, but I think I've run into him a couple times in the Costco down south in Grand Valley. And it's nice to see a friendly face and it's nice to know that we have family everywhere. My family that was four, six people, if you count my mother and father, to 21,000 employees and, and Caltrans family. And you guys are always gonna be there for each other. Now, I'm sure this isn't the only story you've heard. I'm sure each and every one of you have your own personal stories. I've only been with the department for 23 years and I fully expect my work family is gonna continue to grow and mature. And I'm so proud to be a part of it. And I hope that all of you understand how lucky we all are 
Um, there are times when family fights. I'll be the first one to say that. Um, there will be times where you probably won't want to hang out with your work family. That does happen. But in my career, we always come back to we're all human and we all care for each other. And in time of need, we all step up and we do what's right for each other. So that's my story. Um, you know, I know it's sort of a somber one, but I hope it's a joyful one too at the same time. Knowing we're going to the holiday season. I'm probably over my my limit on my time. Um, but I wanted to at least highlight it principally because you all are my work family. Um, I'm very proud to be a part of your lives and happy to have you be a part of mine. Um, and I'm very, very proud that we have in our Caltrans strategic plan, the word that was thought hard to include, and that's pride. Um, for those that, that uh, aren't familiar with every word in our, our Caltrans strategic plan, um, I'm not going to go over what that definition and what everything is, but I'm going to read one excerpt from it, right? Okay. Caltrans pride is defined as one Caltrans family. We are proud of our work and strive for excellence in public service. So I hope all of you know that I have pride in everything you do. I have pride in this department. I'm an advocate for you every time I hear somebody say, oh, Caltrans this and have a derogatory comment. I'm the one that's fighting to say, I work for Caltrans and I'm very proud of what we're able to accomplish. All of us have a unique tie and a fabric that we can say we do together. Do you know what that is? What we do, no matter what you do for Caltrans, you all are making sure that people, residents and visitors of Orange County and the state of California can get from one place to another to enjoy their family, their friends, their work and their life. And all of you have a role in also continuing to make the California economy flourish. And that's something no matter what we're doing for this department, we all are part of and we should all be very proud of. So all in there and I appreciate the time this morning. This is meant to be a Q&A session too, so hopefully we'll have a lot of opportunity for some dialogue. Thank you for the time. What a great story, right? I mean, we all, like you said, we all have our stories. We all have our experiences. We all have our ups and downs, our trials and tribulations. But what he said, what I kept hearing was family first. And in my year and a half here so far, that's what I felt too. Um, my supervisors, my boss tells me, take care of your family. I got my sick, my kids get sick, take care of your family. It works here, right? And hope you guys feel that too, because, and that's one of the reasons, only one of the reasons that I'm proud to wear these orange colors to see that. And uh, it's funny because my kids are getting proud of it too. They're, uh, when we drive on the road, because I always point at the Caltrans truck, I always point at the Caltrans workers. I say, hey, there's my people, there's my crew, there's my, there's my people. And they're like, so like, that is that your people? <laughs> that's them. So, so what Ryan said, family first, it really it resonates with us. And we got a comment online um, from the chat. And the comment said, thanks for sharing us your story with us. I feel so connected with everybody. So thank you. And then uh, to segue into the next section, we do have questions and answers with the other deputy district directors here. Um, they're all represented here today. So we want to field some questions, whether it be online, um, post your questions in the chat. Um, anybody here want to ask a question of any of them? Um, this is your time to do so. So we want to we hear from you. If you have any comments, you want to hear those as well. So um, whoever wants to go first, I will come out to you. We'll ask the questions and we'll give the deputies a chance to answer them. And then let me know if there's any questions in the chat as well. And Ryan said, if you don't have questions, we can ask you guys questions and we want to hear from you. So I like that idea. <laughs> Anybody? Okay, if not, what we're going to do, we're going to, we're going to go to the deputies and we'll call, call them up one by one. And maybe that'll prompt some questions. Maybe you, as you meet them, as you see them, um, and as Ryan said, we're, you know, we're face to face. So as you may put a face to a name, maybe some questions will come up. So um, start off, maybe we can call up uh, Jason McDonald, Deputy District Director of Administration. And we actually have some questions that have come in um, earlier on that we can uh, we can cover some information as well. Jason? Is that better? All right. Well, thank you. Thanks for everyone for making the time today. Appreciate you being here. Um, I, I'll just go down the initial questions that admin got, and if that spurs other ones, just wave your hand, raise your hands. We'll get to those as well. The first question that I got was, do you foresee continuing telework at D12 as it is for now? Will there be any changes with permanent telework for the next year? So, you know, number one, I want to start out at least for 
the folks that are at the district office or in an office location. We've only been doing telework for about six months. So I don't think it's finalized. I don't think it's complete. I don't think we've had even a year to look at the numbers. So I think in terms of that question, uh, it's still evolving and we're going to continue to evolve how telework will work. Is there more time or less time required at the office? Those will be independent decisions made by supervisors with their respective staffs, those functions. So I, I think for now, the questions, there's no permanent telework changes coming, but I would expect there will be changes over time. Uh, the next question that came in for us was, how long will we be in the Santa Ana office? Will the district office be moving in the next five years? And is there an alternate location being considered and where? So I think the, the starting point of that discussion, and with Ryan behind me, I'm sure he'll correct me if I step off too far. Um, the lease at that office is good till 2016, 2026. And so that's what's called a soft lease, meaning either us or the landlord can decide that they're ending the lease. Obviously, we can't move in a 20 day notice or a 30 day notice. So there's some lead time. Um, and at the moment, we're really tying that into the next question regarding how are we going to be doing space at the district office with regard to hoteling or shared cubicles? And so to me, those answers are so interrelated, it's very difficult to separate them. How much space do we need? How often will people be in the office at their workspaces? And then how long will it take us to reconfigure or move? And what does the landlord want to do with that space? So those are questions we're currently underway with. Uh, DGS has come and begun their space allocation process, planning process. Uh, they'll work up a plan and then they'll sort of propose that plan with our modifications as to how to implement that. So at the moment, I think both of those things are possible. Uh, we don't have a definitive answer at the moment because we're still reviewing the facts and the situation. Um, I don't know if you have anything. So I, um, I guess to be more direct, uh, taking the uh, teleworking funds that those that are able to telework um, and running those numbers to evaluate how much space we actually need going forward. So it's very likely we're going to be reducing this work in our district office specific to what's the future look like. Um, you know, we'll continue to monitor what the market trends are for commercial space. Uh, we'll continue to look at what we can do for development of the night mist uh, parcel that's over there by the TMC for those that are familiar with that vacant parcel. We've got some um, some sticks in the fire, we'll say, to see if there's an opportunity to construct a new DO. I want to get everybody's hopes up, but we are chasing that as an opportunity. And then we'll see what pencils out from the cost benefit perspective with the next couple of years. Thank you, Ryan. So the, the, the last question again touched on this idea of hoteling and sharing desks and cubicles. Again, I think that's going to be entirely dependent on what we end up doing with space. So um, in terms of the question, I hope that answers the primary parts. One other question that we received for admin was uh, the idea of a four day work week. And, you know, I think that the standard answer here has to sort of really come from individual work functions and individual offices tasks and what that supervisor needs to do uh, and get accomplished with that group. So that's really something that's going to be, you know, recommended or uh, considered at the at the functional level. Uh, admin is certainly not going to oversee or impose that, uh, but there would be some degree of deciding is that a viable option for any individual work groups. So um, that's all I have from admin, unless there's other questions we can help you answer today. So I will let the chat go and Mike, you want to who's up next? Thank you, Jason. Let's get Jason around. Thank you. Seriously, thank you. Jason. And next on the list, we have Lan, Lan, Joe, Joe. Is that how no. you pronounce your last name? Joe. Lan, Joe, um, for planning. Um, so Lan. Yeah, again, my name is uh, Lan Zhou, and I'm the planning deputy director here, and for ten years. Um, so I decided to stand up here. Years ago, when I was young, I applied uh, to the college, tried to be a teacher. So I got disqualified because of my height. I could not reach the blackboard in a very well. So I hardly ever use the podium. So if I stand behind the podium, probably you don't see me very well. <laughs> so one of the questions, uh, oh, uh, you before uh, you live here, you know I have a nickname, Lan, Lan, L-A-N, 
stands for lovely and nice. That's the initial. N-I-N-N, that's my name. So fits my personality right away, right away. So, and then, um, the one of the question we received from uh, from uh, one of the staff in the district, and uh, they are interested in knowing something more about SCAC and the uh, RTP. So let me explain. The SCAC is stands for Southern California Association of Government. It's a metropolitan planning organization for Southern California. Include uh, six counties: uh, Los Angeles County, Orange County, Ventura County, Riverside and San Bernardino and the Imperium. So they, what they do is they provide planning services and for the entire this six county, this region, and they look, use the socioeconomic data to look at in the future and the 25 years plus and what the future looks like and the transmission system looks like. And so, and now they're doing the, um, they're doing this plan every four years, the cycle. So now, the current one that we've developing will cover until 2050. So, and then now, right now, they're doing those uh, uh, program EIR and they're doing the EIR environmental impact report to the environmental clearance for the entire this plan. And uh, so, um, yeah, so I just want to cover that question first. Somebody need to, uh, would like to know. So we work with uh, uh, District 7 to make sure SCAC knows our department culture's priorities and what's important and our district priority, what's important in Orange County. So, and then uh, make sure uh, when, as before they even get started, what, make sure they know our priorities. That's what we're working on. So I don't want to get into the details. And then today, um, so I'll probably just uh, share a little bit of what our team is doing. And then we are not as famous as you guys in those cultures, uh, Orange, because people know you way more than they know me and my team. So we are, uh, and we do uh, planning, uh, we call planning and local assistance. And we have uh, several functions in our team. Why is uh, doing what we call PIT project initiation document? We initiate all those uh, uh, state highway projects and to repair what you know. If you guys see all the, all the issues, the deficiencies in the road, you know, there's a crack lines and the pavement or bridges, whatever. Those things are all getting reported back to our team, and then to you know, call operation team and. Uh, yeah, we work together with our patient maintenance uh, you know, very closely to get those feedback. Then we know there's the issues need to be repaired, to be fixed. Then we start to initiate the projects, write the documents, and to see, try to fix those things in the field. And then, uh, so come up with a very basic cost, how much cost to do this project, repair the fix this, just like I'll fix the stuff in the kitchen and do home improvement, very similar. And how long it takes to call to, uh, to get it done and what exactly we can afford to do. So basically that's what the one team is doing that kind of stuff. And another team we call local assistance. So get misleading. Lots of people, local people call me for all kinds of issues. They thought, you know, I'm a super woman to help us provide a system for all locals. So that's actually, it's a very big definition. So the real definition is really to help local to do, um, like uh, manage those federal and state funds for them. And then when all the cities need to do trans transportation improvement projects, just like our departments. And it, but they are not in the state highway system, they're on the local streets, intersections. So what our local system team's job, just help them to manage those money and then to make sure the money is uh, well spent and it's, it's uh, appropriate and meet those uh, original federal and state funding requirements. That's one team. Another team is doing the or called transportation planning. That's what we do, uh, review all the local developments and then for all cities. Mm -hmm. And then this year, uh, at this point, we already reviewed more than 100 developments and to see whether there's a, you know, you know, what's the impact on the state highway system, make sure our system will not be significantly impacted. Now we also do uh, prepare a corridor plan to the entire transmission corridor. We want to see what the future look like, what kind of project we should do, and then the map it out. We also have a, you know, uh, we also doing lots of planning special studies, 
and then such as we we did one study a few years ago we completed a uh, managed land what the future express land system look like in orange county so we mapped it out what's the first one we need to do what the second corridor in the next 25 years how are we going to do it so we did a one study like that and that's the first one in the history that we've ever done then afterwards recently last year we completed transit study. We said in the future, we want to enhance transit use in the state highway system, doing the express bus. And then what's the, uh, which freeway has the you know, most mature potential ridership? And then based on the neighboring neighborhood. So we look at those data. So we map up those for the future. We have done that just completed last year. So that's also the first time we've ever done in the entire district history. And then most more recently, we current, uh, developed and uh, uh, called District 12 Action Transition Plan. What do we do is we map up what's the priority and uh, uh, for bike and pedestrian needs in the system. We look at what the deficiencies, what were the gaps, and then we how to make the bike and the pedestrian usage in a safer and a more convenient. And where those deficiencies are, where the gaps are. So, and we complete that. And all the city is really excited about that. And we present it to the local uh, elected officials and other board. And they are well received. They are asking us to for the plan and the data. So that's the one thing. And those things, few the major things we've done recently. There's a one we're currently doing is also very interesting, very important. Is we try to improve the freeway ramps with the local arterials. So you see those intersections and the people walk around very nervous and they deal with the people, you know, the cars just get off the freeway. So we try to identify those uh, intersections and the near the, our interchanges and how to improve for bike and the safe, uh, and uh, pedestrian safety. And then how we can do better timing, better striping, better signage, and everything we can do, and to make it safe for what which area we should focus on first. So that's something we're also doing right now. So um, so then um, right now is a, is the entire division, our team, and have done a hundred percent delivery for all programs in the past ten years, and had a almost perfect records in the, in the uh, past ten years, and then uh, nothing came easy. And we know, and um, we are facing lots of constraints and challenges, and there are constant changes. And then, uh, so we, um, but I think you know our team and the people really step up and to do their best. And still, you know, with all those constraints, they have done the best. But we cannot do such a great job without all the support we, you know, our internal partnership, all the support we received from all functions in the district. So on behalf of our planning and the local system team, and we thank you for all your support, for all your help. And then also we wish you all the best and a happy, healthy, and a safe and a joyful uh, holiday season. Thank you for the great job you guys are all doing. Thank you so much, Ryan. Thank you. And we did have a question that came in the chat, so we can interrupt this for just a second. Um, the question was, full question is, with the reduced dependency on gas, is Caltrans funding expected to reduce as well, or is there a plan to adapt? And that can go to anybody. A long pause means anybody else can stand up and answer the question. So if I heard the question right, it was um, with the. Uh, we're gonna read it. In. The question was: With the reduced dependency on gas, is Caltrans funding expected to reduce as well, or is there a plan to adapt? So this question we we've got we've had before at the town halls. So it's really getting at with more uh, battery electric vehicles and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles on the road. People are, are buying less gas uh, with car efficiency, miles per gallon efficiency ratings going up, even fossil fuel vehicles. Um, you know, you can get a full size truck now that's still getting they used to get like 13 miles to the gallon. Now they're 19. So they're driving farther and buying less gas to go that same same mileage. So the answer to the question is, is over time, yes, we're going to see a deterioration in gas tax revenue coming in. Um, in 2017, the state of California was fortunate enough that we the legislature passed and, and we were able to, to fend off a, a proposition to repeal the gas tax increase. 
um, in 2018. So SB1 passed in 2017, which essentially doubled the amount of money we have coming in for transportation revenue, uh, which sort of shores up that shortfall in the near term. Um, and then also has a, um, a sort of inflation adjustment for hydrogen and, and battery electric vehicles that are taken in under the vehicle registration fees. So trying to catch up that way. Long term, uh, the department in the state of California and many other states and across the nation are looking at how do we switch out from collecting revenue at the pump when you pay for gas to what's called a vehicle mile traveled tax. Uh, where it would be a zero sum change. So what you normally be paying in, in gas tax, you would now pay for how many miles you drive. And that would stop the leakage of, of gas tax revenue in the future. Um, that's still many, many years out. We piloted that. Um, we did a robust pilot a couple of years ago, and we're embarking on a second pilot for road usage charge, what that's called uh, going forward. So when there's political momentum, um, we'll eventually be trending that direction, hopefully. It's a great question. Thank you, Ryan. And oh, good question. Thank you for the questions, guys. Uh, another question came in. Um, OCTA is canceling its current bus route from Metrolink Station to D12 office. Will Caltrans or what will Caltrans do to prevent this to ensure that we can commute using transit? Hey, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> and you want to take this one? I said, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> So the, the question was, OCTA is exploring canceling the, the main bus route that runs by the District 12 office. Um, so our, our role and my role as an OCTA board member, I'm a governor's ex officio member on that board, is to comment on what we think is in the best interest of, of the public. Um, and and I, I attend the meetings where OCTA is evaluating how much it costs to, to run bus service, what the ridership is on each route, where they're trying to migrate routes over to still capture enough ridership to make that bus bus service viable. Um, right now, the route across our, our district office has low ridership throughout most part of the day. Um, and so the discussion and evaluation that OCTA is looking at is, you know, what are the other optimal routes or options that people may have to still be able to get to the district office? I don't have an answer for what that is, um, but I'm fairly certain that within a half a mile or so, there is alternate bus routes. That can go there. We also have van pool and ride share programs that the county offers and, and others offer. So if you are a user of that bus that's going to be canceled or at least modified that service, I'd ask you to reach out to, to your supervisor or to our ride share folks and see if there are other options that you can use. Thank you again, Ryan. Okay, now we'd like to hear from Deputy District Director of Strategic. Project management, Adnan, Maya. Thank you, Michael. Uh, can you all hear me okay? Good afternoon. Uh, very happy to be here. Uh, great job. Uh, my name again is Adnan Maya. I'm the Deputy for Strategic Portfolio Management. I've been with Caltrans for a uh, little bit more than 30 years, almost 31 years. So, Monroe Johnson, I'm on the same cloud as you are, uh, responding to your chat. And I know many of us are in here uh, that have exceeded that milestone. That's a, te that's a testament to what Brian was talking about, that this is an organization that values its people, but also an organization that has quality people that steps up to the plate when we are called upon uh, to deliver projects, to meet commitments, and to be uh, interfacing with the public to do what they are expecting us to do. So all my career has been mostly uh, on the project delivery, captain out the support program side. But I had a year of a stint last year uh, working with the Clean California program, <laughs> working for many, with many of the Frank Verona, Dixon, and many of you here. Uh, on the management side, walking around uh, the freeways, and I can tell you over the last 30 years, I have never seen as many kudos and positive uh, comments come in into Caltrans as I have last year. And that's just a testament to all the hard work and commitment uh, that you all put in in the management team. And I don't want to take 
you're tender away, uh, Bobby, and you're going to cover a lot of girls. But from where I was in Sacramento, and I've mentioned this many times, number 12 is number one on the stage in meeting the commitments. So who goes to you? So strategic portfolio management includes program project management. So that's the COS, Capital Outlay Program Management. That's about a portfolio of $100 million uh, in operating budget every year. That's about 425 people that we have this year. Uh, Hovers about that uh, number year in, year out. But we also cover uh, project management, consultant support units, as well as asset management and strategic initiatives, which is the new uh, branch that got added into the strategic portfolio management. Uh, so we have work with the delivery teams, with project delivery, traffic ops, maintenance, planning, everybody to meet commitments year in, year out, even though we have been challenged with the pandemic over the last few years. So last year, we committed to deliver 109 milestones, and we've delivered 105 of them. That's an amazing track record, given all the challenges that we have. And all of the ones that we didn't deliver were completely outside of our control because of utility companies or because of contractors that just went out of business. So nothing we can do about that. Uh, so well, that's a testament to the commitment that the team does. This year, we're on track to do 100%. So we committed 22 projects to RTL to complete design on. To date, we completed 11 out of the 22. We're not even halfway into the year. $235 million that will go out to construction by the end of the year. So that's a lot of work that's coming down the pipeline. Uh, next year is going to be our marquee year. So we will have 19 projects go out to RTL for a portfolio of $450 million. By far a record of anything that I have seen in my tenure. $450 million in one year. And that includes the 55 corridor that would have multi asset and safety elements for 100 million. Uh, that includes the 91 corridor that would have also multi asset uh, county life, county life, about 120 million dollars broken down into five projects. Three of them would be combined with OCTA projects. So we'll do any efficiency and innovation to reduce the impact of construction to the public. And we're doing it uh, innovatively with all of your thoughts and, and focus on how we do this efficiently. We're also going to deliver uh, every project on the 405 corridor that will dovetail into the design build project. It finishes here. We come in, we pave it. It's going to be a beautiful corridor all the way through from around the 55 all the way to the, the uh, 605. So those all will be delivered next year with both construction and that. So tremendous amount of successes and the uh, delivery uh, commitments that we commit to. And Ryan signs up on the CFD because he relies on us and we need those commitments. So thank you all in here and virtually for all that you do to make that happen. So I want to cover a couple of things that we also do specifically on uh, the strategic initiatives. We also are underway with teams to update strategic business plan to reflect the strategic management plan that was just got adopted. We also are looking at updating the uh, risk uh, assessment. Uh, we also are looking to uh, take a look at the innovation. You all have witnessed the innovation fair uh, just a few months ago. We will continue with that effort with all of your help and commitment. Uh, we also have asset management. So that looks at a 10-year portfolio of the needs 
five years that are underway, five years that are to come. So we're working with headquarters and the teams to identify the needs for the projects that we need the last five years of the 10 year portfolio. Now we are also working on the middle mile uh, roadbed network. So that is an effort that is going to cover the middle mile connection of about 10,000 miles throughout the state. We have quite a few of those in Orange County, and we have 18 projects that project delivery, traffic clubs, everybody is working on to deliver. We will have three projects that will out here in about two, three months. They will all go out through a job order contract, innovative delivery method where we hire a contractor and they are on board and we just give them packages to go and construct. And so that procurement is underway. We expect to have that job order contractor on board for region four that includes Orange County and LA County and Ventura County. We expect that on December 27th to have that proposal in hand so we can have that contract executed and we give them those packages to go and construct. Uh, the fortified design build project, our first in house design build project, one piece out, three design builders have been shortlisted. We have submitted all their innovative concepts. We are looking at it and we will get a proposal in January and we expect to be underway its construction in June. So that's going along very beautifully thanks to the entire team that's working on that. We also are working with TCA on the 24191. Design is almost complete. We're working on the agreements and the collaboration with the other agencies and stakeholders. The I-5 match lane is our first grand trans administered hot lane project in the state. BNED or the environmental document is well underway. It will go out for public review in the summer, completed late uh, in the year. So that's going on as we are scheduled. And then uh, last but not least, I want to talk about uh, the several multi asset projects that we have put together. They're all moving along on the I-5, on the 55, on the 405, on many other convoys. So again, thank you for all the hard work we do. Maintenance teams with the Clean California Initiative. It's been a highlight for the department over the, net, the last year and a half or so, uh, where we, we have been asked to step up to deliver what we have, and thank you for all you do on the project delivery side and the captain of the program. Thank you. Thank you, Adnan. All right, before we bring up the next DVD, we did have another couple of questions that came in the chat. Uh, first one will go to Jason. Um, does executive leadership support promotions in place as well as retain talent? Thank you, Mike. So to answer the question, I think you want to look at promotions in place as one of the other tools that Caltrans has to retain folks. And really, that's the question when it comes that a promotion in place requires an actual vacancy. There's specific requirements and rules that HR is our kind partners to administer and make sure we're following those rules to be equitable and equal. And then finally, you have to look at why we have that vacancy as well. And really, I think that's probably the larger target is how do we retain top talent like everyone that's here today and everyone that's online and keep them happy and employed at Caltrans. And so to answer the question, yes, promotion in place is one of the tools. It's not the only tool and it does have specific requirements when 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 you when we utilize it, excuse me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jason, and thank you for the question online. Uh, another question and uh, I think this just goes to Ryan. Um, how do we account for equity measures for VMT taxation? Low-income households, drivers, or essential workers usually commute a lot more. Okay, so I think that question is rooted in my prior comment when we were talking about gas tax and switching to a road usage charge that's charging people per vehicle miles if it's traveling. Um, under that lens, the switch over to road usage charge would be a zero-sum game where people were typically paying a gas tax, which switch over to an equal amount 
for road usage charge. Um, that's not to say it's a perfect system already. It's, the department is just, you know, state is just now piloting. What that looks like with collections, certainly if you're driving a, you know, F-150 truck and you're getting 13 and a half miles a gallon, you're buying a lot of gas, you know, every day if you're driving, you know, 100 miles a day versus a car if you're driving a Prius that gets 53 miles per gallon and you're driving the same, same mileage. So it's not equal today. It's not equitable today. Um, I'm not going to sit here and say that road usage charge will, will be 100% perfect from the start. Um, but Caltrans, more importantly, is looking at equity and, and how we will move forward with programs, uh, whether it's road usage charge or whether it's, you know, a, a pricing program, let's say it's an express lane or a high occupancy tolling. Some people have asked the same question is, how do we account for equity for those that can't afford to pay to get in an express lane? to get to their destination as fast as others that can afford to pay. Um, and I'm proud to say that we acknowledge that that's something we need to be exploring and researching and studying. That's why in our I-5 managed lane project, we're connecting the state's first Caltrans first equity analysis in our environmental process. And the end result, hopefully, will tell us, are there equity impacts when it comes to pricing, especially on I-5 and, and converting H of E lanes to, to toll lanes? Um, and if there are equity impacts, what programs can we put in place to mitigate them? So it may be taking revenue generated from tolls for people that can pay and discounting transit or, you know, giving discounted toll prices or free, you know, toll pass to people that, that can't afford to, to use it. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to, to have everybody just think about, you know, what equity means for you. I think a lot of times people think equity is equality and it's not the same. Equality is, you know, everybody getting the same thing at the same time. Equity to me is acknowledging that everybody doesn't start in the same place. So it's tough to achieve equality if you don't start with thinking about equity. You know, if you had the wherewithal or your, your family growing up had the wherewithal to send you to a private school to pay for a new pair of shoes that made you better at sports or whatever it may be, you may have a leg up from some of that didn't. And we need to acknowledge that there are barriers when it comes to that. And, and we need to do what we can to to make that fair and equitable for everybody. So I just uh, make sure to remind everybody thinking about equity in a different lens than equality and what that means for you. Thank you, Ryan. Okay, next we're gonna hear from Deputy District Director of Project Delivery, Matt Kajin. Okay, I got this figured out now. Okay. Okay. I'll start off with a question that was sent to me by one of our office chiefs, Carl Lindquist, right here. <laughs> they say hi, Carl. Yeah, Carl. I have a question. What was the So it says, which recent innovations are being included in our design and construction project? Permanent features work that help reduce main. Uh, Reduce maintenance, frequency, cost, and worker exposure. And in our permanent features, a lot of the work we're doing right now, the kind of, can you hear that okay? There we go, okay. A lot of the work we're doing now is um, is work that is the under the asset management program. And where we're doing that is we're coming in and doing a lot of projects where we're doing a lot of different things. Instead of just one thing, say pavement, we're coming in also doing traffic signals, we're doing guardrails, we're doing drainage projects, we're doing a lot of different things in one project to get a lot of that work done one time, get in, get out, and get it up to up to current standards so it requires less maintenance from the uh, field staff. A couple of things, though, I do want to mention is other things that we're doing to reduce uh, uh, worker exposure, not only for Caltrans staff, but also for our contractor staff. But some of the things, and Carl's group is working on this a lot, is, um, is increasing our construction work windows uh, whenever possible. Uh, trying to give the contractor longer periods of time to get out there and do more work. So he has to be out there less times for closures and extending it to the point of we're even trying to look at opportunities for longer term closures over, say, a long weekend, about 56 hour closures, if we can make those work. So with that, um, just wanted to uh, do some acknowledgements. Uh, as Michael said, I'm the uh, the deputy director for project delivery and what that means is i'm in charge of basically three groups design construction and right-of-way and within that i have six offices 
And within those six offices, up until about six months ago, I had, I was operating for about a year and a half with only about half of those offices with permanent chiefs. I was able to promote a couple of people in permanent positions over the summer. And I want to acknowledge those people right now. Son, raise your hand. Son, Lynn, he's our new instructor field office chief. Uh, many of you know Sun for many years. He was our uh, he worked in design. Actually, he worked right across the right across the next cubicle over from me. We were both supervisors in design for many years, and he did many of the projects here in Orange County. Uh, additionally, uh, Andrew, raise your hand. Andrew Oshring, he's our office chief for design one, and he uh, actually took over the office that I was managing before. He along with uh, there's Lisa, Lisa Ramsey, our other office chief. <laughs> She's not new, um, but uh, she's been a she, but she's kind of new to design. She came over uh, soon after I got my job in, yeah, as the office chief for design a couple of years ago. <laughs> so also uh, one other person I don't think they're here that I wanted to introduce. Uh, a lot of you don't know. Um, her name is Jennifer Pham. I don't think she's here today. Nope, I don't see her. She's our new right of way chief for the office of right of way and right of way engineering. Okay. Um, so. As you found out, project delivery has a number of different areas. We also have a lot of people working for us. We're as, almost as big as operations and maintenance here division. There's a lot of the people here we have here are all working here today. Um, my, uh, our division has a little over 300 people between construction, design, right of way, and we even have a group out, uh, a special group out overseeing the, uh, the OCTA project that's widening the 405 freeway which currently is at over 85% completion right now. And that project is slated for opening towards the end of next year. Um, they're actually gonna start putting in the tolling, the infrastructure to do the tolling, to, you know, to, to collect the tolls and things starting next month. And that's all on track right now. So they're somewhere between 85 and 90% complete on that job. So um, additionally, um, what else we got here? Um, a lot of the projects uh, we're working on are rapidly moving towards construction. One of those is broadband. Uh, as you heard from Adnan a few minutes ago, uh, broadband projects, broadband middle mile, uh, we were working on that for about the last year or so, year and a half on broadband. But we only had a couple of projects going. Then over the summer around August, they decided, well, we wanna, instead of delivering just a couple of projects, we wanna deliver them all at once. So staff had to take and develop project or develop plans and uh, specifications that could be handed out within about two months. So a number of staff, not only in design, but in many other divisions, environmental, right of way, right of uh, uh, traffic, uh, environmental engineering, a lot of different groups had to come together very rapidly to put together those packages. And between August and uh, October, they put together all 18 packages and put them out on the street for advertisement. And that's what we're talking about here a couple of minutes ago. That is currently that will be opening later in October in December and in, Jan in early January. And we'll find out then, you know, the uh, the magnitude of these projects, because these are huge projects, 10,000 miles. Now here in Orange County, we're actually only we're our share of the of the broadband system is only 40, 148 miles of the total 10,000. Okay. Uh, let's see what else is there. Um, oh, one thing that our office is doing, and I want to acknowledge Andrew and Son, among a number of other people here, uh, for their efforts on this, was something we started about five years ago in the in the office design, and which kind of developed and moved as part of the division of project delivery, is the engineering mentorship program. We have been working for five years with students from the University of California, Irvine, their civil engineering students, as part of their senior project. During their senior year, they have to do a project, civil engineering project. And we've been working with them, working with their teams, mentoring them for the past five years. We've had five teams. And out of that, we've actually been able to hire several people, not only here in District 12, but other districts they've been hired into also to work with Caltrans as permanent engineers. And so we're looking at this as a big, um, a big pay, not only a payback to the community, but also an ability to bring new people into the organization. And we're getting some really good talent out of the schools because they're finding out what's available to us or what's available to them coming to work for us. So I wanted to acknowledge uh, the staff who's been working on that. 
And I didn't want to put a plug in. We're always looking for more mentors to help out because we're also starting our third year of mentoring students at Cal State Fullerton in their civil program. So we've got two different programs we're mentoring right now. So it takes a lot of time for people to do this, even if it's just, you know, we meet with them about one hour a week, but when you meet with several groups, it's a couple hours a week to meet with them. So anybody who's interested, let us know, okay? Uh, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, just wanna bring up one more thing. Uh, that remarkable challenge that we had when in August, when we were told to bring broadband on, uh, get it done in two months, there was a lot of staff who worked very hard and became extremely adaptable because the requirements we had were changing literally a couple of times a week. What we had to, the requirements we had to meet to get the projects out. These staff had to be able to adapt to those things constantly. These constant changes while they were trying to develop these plans. And there were a lot of staff who did, who did a huge effort to make that happen in design, right of way, construction, traffic operations, um, environmental, everybody pulled together to make this happen. So I want to congratulate all those people. And again, just want to thank everybody for coming out today and also uh, wishing everybody a very happy holiday season. Thank you, Matt. Now we'd like to bring up uh, Director of Maintenance and Operations, Ms. Bobby Hetick. Thank you, Mike. Everybody else worked out their phone and I'm still on paper. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> um, I'm glad uh, I have the privilege of talking with you today. Uh, I, not to outdo um, my friend Matt, but I, I think I'm the only one who has 100% of their office chiefs here with us today. That's Carl. He's 100%. Good <laughs> job. <laughs> Um, uh, I want to share a little bit um, about Clean California. I recognize if, if you want to watch something that's fun, go to a maintenance statewide deputy meeting when it's been decided that maintenance will pivot their resources and do something completely new. Um, it's kind of a knockdown drag out fight as we uh, try to identify the constraints we have when we're given something innovative to take a hold of. Uh, we were asked to um, work on Clean California, not just in the project side, but also with our staff in the field, uh, doing an awful lot of the work, not just along the roadside, in managing the SPP crews, in manning the dump days. Uh, we're coming up on the Lake Forest dump day, December 10th. Uh, thank you, first to Eric, who organizes all of those. But what, what I like about the Lake Forest one that's coming up is that's where we started. That was the first one that we organized. And um, I got a taste for what it's like to work. You thought that managers couldn't work. We didn't have enough staff for unloading all of the, the, the citizens trucks and U-Hauls that they brought mattresses, couches, glass tables, bookcases. And the PIO team here, Lake Forest, Lake Forest City PIO team. There are three people, our three people, me and Eric unloaded how many, how many dumpsters worth of material? Seven full size 40 foot dumpsters of material. So it is possible for managers to work. I have that one story to share with you, <laughs> but they, they can work. Um, so uh, thank you to the crews. I recognize faces here who have manned those dump days. Uh, we appreciate how really polite and uh, hardworking you are. It's another place where what we really do, our mission meets our customers. Uh, Adman's program, it, we're bringing you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars through in the capital programs uh, project. That's a big part of what this department does, but where our customers meet us is where they meet you at a closure and you're there to, in a friendly way, help them get through the closure. The times that we help uh, citizens on the roadside, the culvert crews are keeping the culvert open, uh, the TMC 24 hours a day. They're not here today because just like field maintenance and traffic operations and construction, they work 24 hours a day. So um, pivoting to some of the innovations that are going on in, in maintenance. And if we get a question for operations or maintenance comes to the chat, please interrupt me. I've got a couple of questions here, but um, I wanna um, 
wave at Pauline Wynn and her team. She's in the back. She's tiny. She, she didn't wear shoes as high as land, so you can't see her. So maybe Lynn can wear her shoes. But um, her team and, uh, and, and Roger Bannell's team uh, we're working on innovative camera, two different innovative camera projects where we're using partnering with industry to, to use near miss technology where the camera actually has software in it and it sees things happening at the intersection. And we're going to see what we can do with that near miss information to see if we can identify places we want to make it safer for pedestrians, bicycles, cars, all of our users. Um, we're also partnered with headquarters and did this crazy thing where they bought 70. Is it still 70 cameras? 72, 72 cameras, uh, traffic cameras. And then we went over to our friends in project development and said, hey, wouldn't you like to let us put all these cameras into one of your projects? And we don't have a whole lot of resources, but it's really good for the, the department. It's good for the users on the road. And that's where District 12 is always a leader. Ryan's shown leadership there when headquarters asks for somebody to do something innovative. He's the first one to raise his hands and I'm, I'm trying to trying to. Within the limitations that we have say, yes, and our, what we. The resource we have that other districts don't have is the people that are here, but are willing to try to find a way to do that innovative item. Um, thank you to everybody who's been working on those innovative projects. And I 100% in my heart know it takes you off of things that you need to get done for your own performance measures, for your own grades, for your area, for landscape. I know it's hard. I know it's hard to do things. We don't, we don't make the decisions that come down from the top all the time, but we do deliver every time. And that's, that's, that's what District 12 does best. Um, I wanted to, Thank you, Lisa. Lisa's one of my favorite project <laughs> development office chiefs. <laughs> one of my five favorite. Um, I, I want to acknowledge the uh, the TME group is only three people. Shivinderji, you want to say hi to folks? For those who don't know what TME is, it's Traffic Maintenance Electrical. It was a group that was invented um, when Dina was here, and Shivinderji was uh, instrumental in that group statewide in developing what their charter would be. And it's a bridge. It's a bridge between field electrical and TMC communications operations and design and also HM, Highway Maintenance Program projects. Some of you have had contact with Susan Fong and Ben Njapa, the maintenance engineering team that does those maintenance funded projects. So with Shavinder G's help, with Gary Slater's help, the HM project program has expanded the amount of projects we can deliver in that fast pace uh, design in one year, construct in another year uh, projects that are putting more safety devices, more TMS elements, repair of those devices. And um, there's one other thing I'm forgetting. Oh, uh, 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 complete streets elements, which in, in small projects can be very simple improvements for bikes and pets. It is often paint and signs and things, but there's intersections where that really makes sense. And we're squeezing those in. And crosswalks, yeah, ladder crosswalks, more visibility in those crosswalks for pedestrians. So I'm probably I'm right, I'm using too much time, but I want to look at camera technology. Yeah. Oh, questions? Uh -oh. Questions? Okay. From okay. So I'll start. We got some questions that were sent in ahead of time. And I'll go ahead and run through some of those. If anybody here has a question or follow-up, please just raise your hand and let me know. So um Oh, I, before we leave Clean California, I want to let everyone know that March 25th is going to be the statewide Clean California Community Day. And Spring, it's uh, we're going to be coordinating with local cities, schools, uh, junior colleges to do events for cleanup. Uh, maintenance will have a few roles, but we're trying to minimize how much of a draw that is on field maintenance, and Eric is working on that. But, you know, if your church group or a uh, community group wants to do a cleanup event, uh, it, you could focus it around March 25th. It's going to bring up like a week's worth of activities. And I think there are some resources available in California for pickers and other things for community groups to come out and do those that work. Um, uh, the, the other item in Clean California is I think that we're going to start seeing the, um, the public litter campaign. Uh, reaching the public is really difficult now with the information overload that everybody has. Uh, but Clean California is doing a media campaign that's out of our headquarters office, and they're gonna coincide that as a lead up, as we lead up to that March date. Um, so in the questions, uh, this was a great question, and there was a lot of discussion about this um, with our managers is, the legislature passed a bill that's gonna give 
uh, starting next year to assure that fast food workers make $22 an hour. And so the question that came into us is how do we retain and recruit and ask people to do the really difficult work that we do if you can make that much money in fast food? And the truth is that fast food, that legislation that came through, we don't, here at Caltrans and Management cannot affect the legislature. We, we don't have a vote there. Um, but that legislation did not require those folks to have support benefits, dental, medical, vision, training, career opportunities, and pension. That's where the difference comes in. That's where I'd like all of you, if you've got friends or relatives that are thinking about a career with Caltrans, let them know there's there's a greater benefit than just the dollar price, they, the sticker that they put on the front. Here, not only do you have family, you could have a lifetime career that has a chance at real promotion. Um, so I, I wanted to acknowledge that question and then um, ask if anybody had any any additional comments or questions about that. We we can't make any we can't make any statements about you know union negotiated items. That's 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 not what I'm here to do or allowed to do. But if anyone has any questions, they're happy to take those. I should have made people sit in the front up here and then they'd be close enough for the question. Uh, another question that came in is the MOOC. Is there a question? Um, I'm going to move on to the next question. The move over law. If motorists see flashing lights, they should move over to the next lane. It does not seem to be enforced. What ideas does District 12 have for the laws to be enforced? Um, we have challenges with our with uh, enforcement in a lot of different areas. The move over law is actually doesn't demand that a driver moves over. And in urban areas, it may not be possible for them to move over into traffic, but they are required to slow down. And drivers being able to slow down to pay attention to the roadside work is what the objective of the move over law is about. Um, having, with all the conflicting uh, resource demands that CHP has, they support us in our MAZI program, they support us in our COZI program. If we have an area where we're gonna be working with flashing lights and we need more support, we need to lean on that program to make sure CHP is there rather than on a countywide level, um, just kind of complain to them to do more move over enforcement. I don't think that that's gonna be an effective way, uh, but but let's use, let's, let's streamline. If you're not getting the maze support that your unit needs, uh, come and come and talk to me and we'll talk to the Lieutenant and the captains and try to try to get that focused, try to make it a little bit safer. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to say, I think that the value in the move over campaign is getting people to want to do it on their own. By doing that and utilizing a carrot approach instead of an enforcement stick approach, I think that's where we're going to have staying power. We're getting people to, to move over when they see maintenance and construction crews out there. Um, you know, I've I've been out on the I-10 and had a pop tire, and I can certainly tell you that when you're driving in a rural route, people move over and they give you that space. In the urban area it doesn't happen as much, but I think the more we can get the messaging out about it, the more we can routinely put it on CMS signs and network television and radio spots, the more we can empower people on why it's important. And the why behind it is we all want to make sure that all of you come home safe to your families. And we all want to make sure that we don't lose another member of our family. And the more we can talk about that to the public, the more we're, we're getting them to do it with that care approach instead of that enforcement violation state approach. And I think that's a better spot to be in. Thank you, Ryan. That's a good point. And I think between the time this question came in and, and today, we did have a CMS message uh, that was about the move over law. So we are putting those up on the CMS message boards and those go out statewide where it's a consistent message all the way across the state, except for the boards that are lit for construction purposes, uh, traffic delays and the other things that the CMSs are used for. Let's see, what's your next question? Are there plans? Are there plans to upgrade any maintenance field lo office locations uh, with a uh, desert landscape or other landscapes similar to the district office? This would be a great way to boost employee morale. The, 
improvements at the maintenance yards is through the HM program, HM5, or through capital programs. So if you have an idea for uh, an improvement that's needed at a maintenance station, the pot of money that's able to do those improvements is pretty small, but it's Susan Fong's group in maintenance engineering that takes in the requests and administers those projects. Um, I think that this is a reference to an innovative uh, project that the, I see, I see the drone team is here. They helped themselves to their own backyard and built their own garden, which 100% uh, support. Uh, it was not, it's not a requirement, of course, but it's another example of innovation where we do for ourselves. But the department really does want to have pride in our facility. This is a beautiful facility here. And um, I'm really looking forward. Is Arvin still here? If, if Arvin's here, please wave from maintenance engineering. He's our facilities coordinator for the capital programs, and he's been working very, very hard on the reconstruction plan for the orange maintenance yard. So that, that was what I was going to end with was an explanation that the orange maintenance yard not only went through the planning phase, it's in, it's in I think, the architectural design phase uh, to get a full reconstruction. So we'll have a new facility for us to uh, ex expand the number of crews that can be in that location. We understand that the a crew density in all of our yards is too high. The, 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 the facilities weren't designed for the number of people we have working there. And um, I, I wish I, I was going to pick on Arvin to get the to get the, the construction date. It's still a few years away, uh, but we are with the resources we have marching down that path to try to upgrade. There's small projects that happen at the maintenance yards, but that's that's our large one is is a full reconstruction of the orange yard. Um, I, I, didn't, I didn't deliver that very well. I got the bang and the applause, but new maintenance station. I want to go ahead and turn it back over to Mike and let there's been some questions from, from the chat. Thank you, Bobby. Let's give it another hand, huh? And last, we got one more. Uh, representing Chris Flynn, who's not able to be here today, uh, Alvin Fung is going to represent environmental today. He's got some things to share. Wow, look at that support. I love it. Thank you guys. So I'll, I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, I know everyone uh, that spoke before me had really great things to say. So hopefully you guys uh, would, uh, yeah. So uh, I'm acting for Chris Lynn in this seat. Uh, he couldn't be with here. So I do want to share some, a few things from the vision environmental analysis. First off, for Senate Bill 743 compliance, um, here in the Division of Environmental Analysis, we have to do a different type of traffic analysis, and we're looking at vehicle miles traveled. Uh, I know that Ryan touched upon this uh, metric or this, this terminology uh, before, uh, but vehicle miles traveled is really trying to understand how we can under, how we can build projects and uh, the type of traffic impacts or benefits that this project can provide to the community, uh, especially with Orange County. One of the challenges with this new PMT analysis, so I'll stay that for now on, is that we have to look at new different types of mitigation, right? Um, and the new types of mitigation is going to be, uh, you know, it's, it's too early to determine, but it's going to be uh, items that are going to be beneficial for the community as well as uh, for Caltrans. So currently there are two projects that are undergoing this analysis. Uh, the analysis is not complete. But I just want to give a shout out to these two projects. The first is the Orange County Transportation Authority uh, I-5 improvement project from uh, San Diego County line to Avenida uh, Pico. Uh, and then the other project is the Caltrans District 12 project, the I-5 Vance Lanes project that begins at Red Hill Avenue and goes to the Orange County, Los Angeles County line. Um, as I mentioned, these two projects are, are undergoing that analysis. Uh, some of the mitigation types that are just in discussion um, could be something such as transit subsidies. <clears throat> so uh, I, I do want to touch up on uh, another topic that uh, Ryan briefly uh, mentioned, and that is the equity study. So this I-5 managed project that we are working on, we are conducting our first ever equity study. For, to me, it's very exciting. I'm actually uh, one of the planners working on this study. And it's exciting to me because it's a new way to look at how we understand how projects impact communities. Um, one of the ways that we're really trying to understand more about these communities is that our outreach is, is uh, you know, we're taking a different approach. And the approach that we're doing is that we're leveraging local uh, relationships, such as the city planners. Uh, we're, we're trying to reach out to community-based organizations or CVOs 
We're also even uh, reaching out to neighborhood associations to really understand how can we reach out to these uh, communities to understand their experiences, uh, to understand their life, you know, uh, their behavior, the travel patterns, and potentially uh, be able to put us in a position that we can uh, put in the, in the project benefits or opportunities for, for, for these communities after their studies done. But it's too early for us to really conclude any of that, but uh, I do want to mention that it's really exciting for, for me, and I know that uh, you know, there's folks behind me that <laughs> understand the equity study is, is a really hot topic, and we're really trying to do things a little different. Uh, there are two items I do want to mention about, uh, uh, two items I want to mention. First off is clean California projects. This is not my topic, but I do want to mention that here in the Division of Environment Analysis, we are working hard to support everyone in Clean California projects. And you know, we're you know what we do essentially is that we we make sure that when we have projects, Caltrans projects, that we're in compliance with environmental rules and regulations, specifically the processes. So uh, it's really taking us out of our pretend usual framework of having a build schedule, and we're really trying to power through. And that goes to say with the middle mile broadband network projects. Uh, yes, they came in uh, as a, uh, and together and you know, the schedules are a little tight, but here in the Division of Biome Analysis, all of the folks that I work with, we are really doing our best and trying to put together our, 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 our best efforts to, to deliver these projects. Lastly, I am a little nervous, so I apologize. <laughs> Lastly, I do want to give provide a few division updates. So first off is retirement. Uh, for division of analysis, I am very far from retirement, but I do want to mention that uh, in the last year, there have been several people who have retired from uh, our division. Uh, one of those is the senior environmental planner, Charles Baker. He oversaw the specialist unit in environmental planning. Um, and so, right now, Brian Lewis is acting in his position until we can find a permanent replacement. Uh, so we also have a uh, few, uh, actually, multiple uh, engineers in our division that retired this past year. And in the very near future, we're probably going to have a few more retired. So, on that note, I do want to mention that uh, uh, division environmental analysis, um, Chris Flynn, and, and everyone supporting him, that we are actively engaged in recruitment as well as succession planning. We, we do recognize that you know succession planning, uh, you know, involves a lot of. Sorry, well, we recognize that with all the knowledge and all the experience we had, it's really important to pass that down and to really. Teach those same lessons so that the same mistakes are not made, so that processes improve and relationships are are, are really built upon. Uh, lastly, uh, this is my last item I do want to share. So, uh, <laughs> we actually received a, an award uh, of excellence for uh, a hard won victory for the State Route 241, State Route 91 Told Express Lane project from the American Planning uh, Association here in the California chapter. Thank you, Dr. Cross. Uh, one name I do want to bring up is uh, Bahar Hidari. She's one of our planners here uh, here at District 12. Uh, she was our lead environmental planner. She's a generalist. And uh, I do want to acknowledge that this effort of the success, this award that we received is, is a team effort. There was no way that we could deliver without design's help, uh, without right of way's help, uh, without all the other functional units here. So uh, I, I do want to you know, bring that up that uh, with hard work, you know, and, and perseverance, you know, we, we can achieve. So that's all I want to say. Thank you guys. <laughs> Thank you, Alvin. And you did a great job. Nervous? Couldn't tell. Couldn't tell, right? <laughs> <laughs> so guys, um, thank you all. It's, does anybody have any questions before we close this out? Anybody here? Uh, for those of you online, we're gonna whatever questions you have in comments, we're gonna take those. We do appreciate those. Uh, please keep them coming. We'll we'll field those um, afterwards, and we'll get you guys responses and answers to whatever questions you have following this event. Um, but we want to take time to thank the thank Ryan and the deputies for being here today to be able to be in front and ask, answer any questions, so you guys can meet them, see them as well. Um, some closing remarks. Ryan wanted to close us out. If you would. I, I think I said if there weren't questions for us. I was going to ask some questions for you. Right? Oh, Lord. So get ready, your hands warm. Here's the question. How many of you have had a near miss incident out on the road? Raise it high, if you have. Okay, look around. More than half. Okay. So it's not all maintenance. 
I've had near misses too. So the reason why I asked that question, and many of you have heard me say this before, um, Caltrans family means something to everybody. We want to make sure that all of you go home to your personal family. But we want to make sure you stay in our family too. So please remember why you're out there. You can't you can't protect the you know everybody all the time. You can't cure stupidity, in my opinion. Um, distracted driving, inebriated driving, under the influence driving, it happens. We're doing our best with CHP and law enforcement to curb as much as we can. But please be aware, continue to be aware. You know, watch out for your colleagues, your Caltrans family members, um, because the, the worst nightmare a district director can ever have is a phone call in the middle of the night saying one of our family members passed away. So please keep that in mind. I, I would have rather seen zero hands go up, but I acknowledge many of you have had 20, 30, 44 years, I think, with the department now. I think somebody had 43 or 44. Um, pretty sure bet you've all had a near miss or will have a near miss at some point. So please be safe out there. Um, I, I want to just leave you with a quote because I spent a lot of time trying to find it, so I'm going to say it anyways. Uh, this is from Colin Powell. Okay. People get work done, not buildings, not staffs in a generic sense, and not plans, but people. I want to say you are the people that make Caltrans District 12 such a great place to work. You are the people that achieve such grand successes, and you are the people that makes everybody in Orange County's lot in life better. So I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you for the time. Appreciate you being here today. You know what? I lied. That's not my end, but I wanted to thank everybody that helped put this this event on. Uh, there are too many people to name, but from the admin side, you know, from safety, you might prepare it. Um, from IT setting it up for everybody at Mata Mat uh, from Matavia Yard to help us put the tents up, giving us time out here to visit with all of you. Really do appreciate it. Except your house, give yourselves a round of applause. Yeah. Thank you very much. Woo! Lindsay, thank you very much. Really appreciate your effort in this too. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And we, if you guys have some time, please visit the tents. We have HR, we have safety, and then we have uh, California represented. So